Hello and welcome. My name is Victor Gijsbers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this series of videos, I want to talk about one of the most famous books of 20th century philosophy, namely Ludwig Wittgenstein's Tractatus. The original German title of the book is Logisch Philosophische Abhandlung, which means something like Logico Philosophical Treatise, but it has become much more widely known under the name of the English translation, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Um, I have chosen to talk about this book in part because I recently published a new Dutch translation of it myself, and so I'm making a series of Dutch language, language videos uh, using this new Dutch translation. But because my YouTube channel is, uh, is normally in English, I've decided to also make these videos in English. And of course, for the English version, I won't be using my Dutch translation. Instead, I will be relying on the two most well-known, most widely read translations um, that are available in English. The translation by Ogden and Ramsey, which Wittgenstein himself, um, well, oversaw is too big a word, but at least he saw it and he, uh, he gave some comments on it. And so it's, it's, it's sort of official. Uh, and the later Peirce McGuinness translation. There are at least two other translations um, available that, that can be found. And I've heard rumors about even more English translations being in the make right now. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to choose from. I will be probably mostly quoting the Ogden translation, sometimes the Perth McGuinness translation. You can find on the internet a very nice uh, document which has the German text, the Ogden, uh, the, uh, the Ogden uh, Ramsey text, and the Perth McGuinness text in sort of three columns, allowing you to, uh, to, to check out uh, the differences. But especially if this is your first time reading the Tractatus or your second time reading the Tractatus, if you're sort of a, a beginner in terms of the Tractatus, then I wouldn't worry too much about which translation you are using. Let's just see how far we can get with whatever translation you have. All right. Now, why would you watch a series of videos on the Tractatus? It is, after all, a pretty short book. You could read it in an afternoon. Um, and at first sight, it may look as if it is sort of easy to get into. So Wittgenstein seems to have helpfully numbered all his remarks uh, in order to sort of show us their, their logical structure. And he even explains to us in a footnote uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the, first, uh, uh, the first sentence of the uh, main text, there's a footnote that tells us how the numbering system works, that there are seven main claims, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, and then that there are under these claims further subclaims which explain what he is doing. So if we take that literally, then it would seem that Wittgenstein takes a lot of trouble to explain things to us, and so we might think that just reading the text is going to be enough to understand what is going on. If we come to the text with that kind of expectation, we are probably going to be disappointed. Wittgenstein's writing style is what we might call apodictic. He just makes claims which are supposed to be true, clearly true, necessarily true, and we are sort of generally just supposed to see that. Sometimes he explains them, sometimes he gives arguments for them, but rarely in a very straightforward way, and certainly not always. Actually, the text requires the reader to do a lot of work. We have to spend a lot of time thinking about what Wittgenstein means, uh, what he wants to say, how the different things that he says hang together, um, how we should interpret his claims in order to sort of make them hang together, and so on and so forth. So the Tractatus, for all its immediate sort of sensuous appeal with those, with those numbered theorem-like statements, and some of the bon mots, like the, the, the beautiful sayings, even the famous sayings, like that which we cannot talk about, we must pass over in silence. Um, it is actually an enigmatic and hard text that is best approached with the help of a guide. And there are some good guide books, uh, but this series of videos wants to be a guide to you, the reader, as well. So what I'm going to do in this series of videos is I'm just going to work through the Tractatus. 
Now, I'm not going to take sort of every everything that Wittgenstein says in the Tractatus and talk about it in detail, but certainly in the beginning we will uh, we will be looking at things in, in quite a bit of detail um, in order to get started, in order to sort of get into the right frame of reference, um, have the right basic understanding that we need to, to go on with the text. And then as we go on, I want to pick out the things that I think are either most difficult or most interesting or that will most benefit you, the reader, um, to, to have explained to you. So that's what I, what I want to do. In this first video, I'm going to look at the preface and I'm going to look at the um, statements that start with the number one. So that is just the first half page or so of the Tractatus plus the preface, which is, which is slightly longer. So let's jump right into it. Here is how the preface starts. This book, Wittgenstein writes, this book will perhaps only be understood by those who have themselves already thought the thoughts which are expressed in it or similar thoughts. That is not a very reassuring statement. Right? An author who tells you that, well, here's a book, but you can only understand it if you've already thought the thoughts that I express herein by yourself. Wow, I mean, if we've already thought all those thoughts ourselves, why do we need the book? And if we haven't, right, if we are not Wittgenstein, how are we ever going to understand this? Well, luckily, I would say that, that in this instance, Wittgenstein actually overstates the difficulty. Yes, the Tractatus is difficult. Yes, we will need to spend quite some time thinking about what Wittgenstein means, but we can learn to, to think his thoughts and understand his thoughts, even if we haven't already had them ourselves. At least that is sort of my promise to you. That's what I'm going to help you with. So a little bit further on, Wittgenstein is going to express some very important things about the nature of his project and the nature of his book. He says the book deals with the problems of philosophy. Let's stop right there. The book deals with the problems of philosophy. Like which problems of philosophy? I mean, who says this at the beginning of his philosophy book, right? Normally we would say, well, the problems I'm going to deal with are philosophical problems, but they're this problem or that problem or such a problem. I'm going to, you know, talk about the mind body problem, or I'm going to talk about the nature of time, or I'm going to talk about, there are so many philosophical problems, right? You can't talk about all of them in a book. Well, Wittgenstein, in a sense, thinks that he can, right? That he can talk about the problems of philosophy, all of them, not by going through them one by one. That is not the way that the book is gonna, gonna be structured, but by investigating the very nature of philosophical problems and by giving us a new story. One is tempted to say a new theory, but probably we shouldn't say a new theory. Uh, a new story about what philosophical problems are and how we should approach them. And I say that it's not really a new theory because it's going to turn out that a story about philosophy is itself philosophy. And it turns out that philosophy is something that actually can't be done in any straightforward sense. It turns out that philosophy is not in the business, according to Wittgenstein, philosophy is not in the business of formulating answers of formulating theories that can then be, you know, assessed for the truth or falsity. That is not what philosophy is going to be like at all, according to him. And we will, in fact, already see this in the rest of this sentence. So let's read the sentence again. The book deals with the problems of philosophy and shows, as I believe, that the method of formulating these problems rests on the misunderstanding of the logic of our language. Or, as Percy McGuinness say, that the reason why these problems are posed is that the logic of our language is misunderstood. So what the, what the translations have in common here is this idea that, well, philosophy is based on a misunderstanding. Right? It's because we misunderstand something that Wittgenstein calls the logic of our language, that we ask philosophical problems. And so it is going to turn out that to do philosophy is not to answer philosophical problems, but to see that those problems are based on misunderstandings and so to stop asking them. And hence, Wittgenstein can go on to say, the whole meaning of the book could be summed up somewhat as follows. What can be said at all can be said clearly and whereof one cannot speak, 
thereof one must be silent. Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. This is this famous last sentence of the Tractatus. It's going to turn out that philosophy, as well as certain other things, cannot be said, cannot be expressed. And so instead of making new philosophical theories, we have to learn to be silent about it. Okay, the book will therefore draw a limit to thinking, or rather not to thinking, but to the expression of thoughts. For in order to draw a limit to thinking, we should have to be able to think both sides of this limit. We should therefore have to be able to think what cannot be thought. The limit can therefore only be drawn in language, and what lies on the other side of the limit will simply be nonsense. Here Wittgenstein presents us with a paradox, or a tension, or a problem, that is going to be incredibly important for his entire project, and the way that we have to understand that project, and which is going to come into full force at the end of the text. And the problem or paradox is this, if I want to tell you where the limit of the thinkable lies, if I want to show you that these are the things that can be thought and these are the things that cannot be thought, then it seems that I have to give to some content to those things that cannot be thought. I have to think them, but they cannot be thought. So in order to even grasp in thought a distinction between the thinkable and the unthinkable, it seems as if I have already to be able to understand the thinkable, uh, sorry, to understand the unthinkable, which is impossible. We can formulate the same problem in language, right? If I want to explain to you the difference between things that can be expressed and things that cannot be expressed, well, in order to talk about things that cannot be expressed, I have to talk about things that cannot be expressed. So I have to express things that cannot be expressed, which is impossible. So we're going to sort of bump into a sort of limit, a limit that is very easy to misunderstand because it's a limit where, well, even in order to say that it's a limit, it seems that we have to postulate something that is outside of that limit. But there is no outside of the limit. At least there is nothing that we can think of as being outside of the limit or that we can talk of as being outside of the limit. So can we even talk about such a limit? Can we even think about such a limit? That is going to be sort of the central methodological question that Wittgenstein will have to face. And he will, have to, he will face it most radically at the end of the text. And so we are going to get, get around to, to thinking about this in quite some detail um, as we move on through the book. Okay, Wittgenstein then goes on to say a couple of things about that he's not gonna cite anyone and that he, he doesn't care whether his ideas are new um, and basically you know, explain to us that, that the text is not going to look like a, a standard work of philosophy at all. Uh, and then he tells us this. He tells us that <clears throat> the truth, and again, I'm quoting, this is at the end of the preface, the truth of the thoughts communicated here seems to me unassailable and definitive. That's a big claim, right? The truth of what I'm saying here is unassailable and definitive. Wow, okay. But he goes on and says, I am therefore of the opinion that the problems have in essentials been finally solved. And if I am not mistaken in this, then the value of this work, secondly, consists in the fact that it shows how little has been done when these problems have been solved? Or as Percy McGuinness tells us, um, the value of this work consists in that it shows how little is achieved when these problems are solved. Maybe that shows a little bit better that, you know, what Wittgenstein is suggesting is that it's not that we haven't done a lot of work, but it's that we haven't reached any, you know, very great result. I mean, even when we've solved all the problems of philosophy, it's going to turn out that that doesn't give us very much at all. The problems of philosophy turn out to be, well, in a sense, not very important. And they're going to turn out to be not very important, of course, in part because um, of what Wittgenstein has already told us, namely that they are based on misunderstandings. And so if Wittgenstein's method is going to be to show to us that we have just misunderstood our language and that all the problems of philosophy are based on misunderstandings, 
then solving those problems, or maybe rather dissolving those problems, might be helpful. It makes us stop asking bad questions, but it's not going to give us what we maybe originally hoped, right? The key to the right life or the key to the great insights or something like that. So there's something very modest. Yes, there's something very modest about this text, even though at the same time, there's something incredibly arrogant about the text, right? And here we see it in the same passage. The truth of the thoughts is unassailable and definitive. You can't get more arrogant than that. But you know what the one hand gives, the other takes away. And he says, yeah, but I mean, who cares? Because you, 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 it doesn't really give you anything. Okay. So again, we're gonna, we're gonna learn a lot more about that, about how Wittgenstein thinks about that as we move through the text. So far, so good. That was the, um, that was the preface. Uh, let us go to the numbered claims. And um, the propositions, the individual propositions. And in this video, I want to look at the first few of those propositions, the ones that start with the number one. And again, the idea is that there is this proposition called one, which is sort of a main claim. And then there are going to be several claims, 1.1, 1.2, which explain this claim. And then 1.1 has three further subclaims that explain it, right? 1.11, 1.12, 1.13. And that is according to the, to the footnote here, the way that the numbering system is supposed to work. Now I've already told you that the numbering system in practice maybe doesn't really work that way at all, right? It's really not always the case that um, this logical structure that I've just been presenting to you can be recognized in the actual Wittgensteinian text. But in fact, already on this first page, when we, when we look under number two, we can see the numbering system doing something very weird indeed, right? Because the proposition after number two is called 2.01. What's that supposed to be? 2.01, right? We've just, we've just been told that two, that if Wittgenstein wants to explain two to us, he's going to do that using things called 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. And then if he wants to explain, say, 2.1, he's going to use 2.11. Where does 2.01 come in? Is that an explanation of two that is not important enough to be called 2.1? I mean, how does this work? Okay. Wittgenstein doesn't really explain it to us, but it's something we, uh, we, we may want to be on the lookout for as we read through the text. Here is the famous opening proposition. The world is everything that is the case. Well, what should we think about that? Well, clearly the world is not everything that's not the case. Right, things that are not the case are, are not part of the world, I, I guess. So there's a sense in which the world is everything that is in the case. The world is everything that is the case sounds sort of trivially true. Um, but we would like to hear a bit more, right? We would like Wittgenstein to explain what he means by this. And luckily he does. Here is 1.1, which definitely explains to some extent what uh, proposition one is supposed to mean. The world is the totality of facts, not of things. Ah, so when Wittgenstein tells us that the world is everything that is the case, what he means is that the world is the totality of facts, not of things. Well, why does he think that? Maybe this is explained by 1.11, at least let us look at 1.11, which says the world is determined by the facts and by these being all the facts. And then 1.12 tells us that the for the totality of facts determines both what is the case and also all that is not the case. Now, I think that we can take these four propositions and get some idea of what Wittgenstein is after. So let us look at these two options that are on the table. The first option that says that the world is the totality of facts and the other, the option that the world is the totality of things. So suppose that we take the second option first, the world is the totality of things, right? Then one could think that in order to sort of describe the world, we have to be given a list of things of all the things that there are. So we might say something like, well, there is this green pencil and there is Victor Geispers 
and there is this bust of Nietzsche um, and so on and so forth, right? And we, 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 we tell all these, all these, give a list of all the objects in the world, all the things in the world. Um, and then at the end we say, well, and those are all of them. Is that a full description of the world? Does that determine everything that is the case? Well, no, Wittgenstein can say, it doesn't determine that at all. But right? knowing that I exist and knowing that this bust of Nietzsche exists doesn't tell you anything about sort of the relationships between me and this bust. Right, right now, it's true that I am holding the bust of Nietzsche. I'm holding the bust of Nietzsche in my right hand. Well, knowing that the bust of Nietzsche exists and that I exist doesn't tell you whether I am holding the bust of Nietzsche or whether I'm not holding the bust of Nietzsche, whether the bust of Nietzsche is near me or whether it's very far away from me, uh, and so on and so forth. It doesn't tell you anything like that. So just being given a, a list of things wildly underdetermines what the world is like. Right? It doesn't tell us what the world is like. We need something more. We need to know how those things hang together. And that is the kind of stuff that we express in claims, right? When I make a claim like um, the bust of Nietzsche is in my right hand. So when I'm claiming that it is the case that the bust of Nietzsche is in my right hand, then I'm giving you sort of that missing information about the world. And if I make all of those claims, if I tell you all those true statements about the world, Ha, huh, then I have determined everything that is the case uh, and I've left nothing out. Well, but the things that I express in sentences like that are facts, right? When I say that the bust of Nietzsche is in my right hand, I'm expressing a fact. The fact that the bust of Nietzsche is in my right hand. That is what a fact is, right? It's something that can come after a that clause. Um, it's something that can obtain or not obtain and that is described by a sentence, a sentence that is true if the fact obtains and a sentence that is false if the fact does not obtain. So Wittgenstein actually seems to have a pretty good reason to believe that, you know, that which determines the world must be the facts and not just the things. And so here in those first sentences, what, in those first propositions, what we learn is that according to Wittgenstein, it's the facts that determine what is the case, um, not the things. And so the facts are sort of the, um, you know, the, the, the ontological basis of the world, we could say. Now, there's a further reason why Wittgenstein likes facts. And I have already told you almost everything you need to know in order to, uh, in order to understand what that further reason is. Because I've told you that facts are the things that are expressed by sentences, right? By sentences, sentences can be true or false. They are true when the fact that they express obtains, and they are false when the fact that they express does not obtain. Well, according to Wittgenstein, sentences are the most important elements of language. Right? Words, I mean, words are important, but words really only get their meaning in a sentence. It is sentences. It's the kind of things that can be true or false that are really sort of the elementary elements of language, the important things of language that we need to understand if we want to understand language. And if we want to understand how language hangs together with the world, which is going to be one of Wittgenstein's main themes, the question of how language hangs together with the world. Well, language consists of sentences which are true or false, and they're true or false because they relate to the world, right? Because they can relate to the world, and they relate to the world by, well, you know, expressing those facts. At least, if they're true, they're expressing facts. Uh, if they're false, they're just expressing possible facts, which aren't really facts because they're they're not obtaining. So Wittgenstein's theory of language is also going to sort of point towards an emphasis on the notion of fact rather than on the notion of thing. Although having said that, uh, let me stress that things will be quite important for Wittgenstein too. Two further things I want to talk about in these uh, propositions number one. Let us first look at proposition 1.13. The facts in logical space are the world. Here Wittgenstein brings in the notion of logical space and he doesn't really explain it at all. But I think it's good if we can already 
have a sort of mental image or a sort of conceptual grasp of what Wittgenstein might mean with a logical space and why he might want to say something like the facts in logical space are the world. So I want to give you a story about that, a story about logical spaces, which is perhaps not exactly the story that Wittgenstein would give you, but hey, he's not giving any story here and this is certainly better than nothing. So let's take space, not so much as physical space, but you know, as the kind of abstract spaces that we tend to think about in mathematics. So for instance, we often think about sort of two dimensional spaces by having a coordinate system with a, a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. And then we can pick out points in this sort of two dimensional space. Well, there's a way to set up such a coordinate system in such a way that points can be um, interpreted as facts. So let's, for instance, take my Nietzsche bust. My Nietzsche bust has a lot of properties, but let's focus on two properties. It has a certain weight, a certain mass, uh, and it has a certain volume. And so what we could do is we could set up a coordinate system, which has like a vertical axis, which contains different weights that my Nietzsche bust could have, and a horizontal axis that contains different volumes that my Nietzsche bust might have. Now let's suppose that my Nietzsche bust weighs 500 grams and has a volume of 0.1 liter. Well, in that case, like my Nietzsche bust is at a certain point in this sort of coordinate system, right? The truth, if we want to say it that way, is at a certain point in this coordinate system. At 500 grams and at 0.1 liter, like there's a point there. And we can say that that point is or represents the fact that my Nietzsche bust weighs 500 grams um, and has a volume of 0.1 liter. And all the other points in this coordinate system would seem to correspond with other possible states of affairs or other possible facts, right? There's a point like one kilogram, one liter, which would be sort of, you know, correspond with the fact of my Nietzsche bust being one kilogram and one liter of volume. Um, which is not, in fact, you know, the physical truth about my uh, my Nietzsche bust, but it could have been. Right? It's a it's a possible a possible fact that my Nietzsche bust is that heavy and that big, uh, and so on and so forth. Right, different points in this coordinate system correspond with different ways that my Nietzsche bust could have been, and so they correspond with facts with facts of the form that Nietzsche bust weighs exactly uh, this much and it has exactly this volume. But facts don't have to be fully precise, right? I could have, uh, let's say a fact, I could have the fact that my Nietzsche bust weighs 500 grams. That doesn't say anything about the volume, um, but it's a fact or it could be a fact. And in my two dimensional coordinate system, there's a certain part of the system a certain set of points that corresponds to this possibility, right? The possibility that the Nietzsche bust weighs 500 gram would just be all the points at the 500 gram line, right? Corresponding with 500 gram and then, you know, any volume that you can possibly think of. That line corresponds to a fact, right? It corresponds to the fact of the Nietzsche bust weighing 500 gram, leaving everything open about the volume. In fact, any area in my coordinate system corresponds with some fact. So if we take, let's say a little square, a little square below the 100 gram line and below the 0 0.1 liter line uh, or to the left of the 0 0.1 liter line, that's a little square. And if I take that entire square sort of filled in, that area corresponds with the fact that the Nietzsche bust weighs at most 100 grams and has a volume of at most 0.1 liter. And in this way, any area of my two dimensional code in the system can be thought to correspond to a particular fact. Okay, now, instead of taking only my Nietzsche bust and instead of taking only two of its properties, let us assume that we can set up a coordinate system with an incredible number of dimensions 
maybe even infinitely many dimensions, such that everything that could be different about the world is somewhere in there, right? So by choosing a particular point in the coordinate system, I am choosing a particular weight and size and color and everything else for my Nietzsche bust and for every other thing in the world and for all the relations that all those things have to each other. Think of that as logical space, right? Then any point in that space is gonna correspond with having made all these choices, right? With a fully determinate story about what the world is like. Like the bust weighs did this much, it has this color, it is at this distance from Victor Geisberg, and so on and so forth. If you determine everything, you get one point. And so one point corresponds to a world or to a sort of fact that describes an entire world. Other points correspond to other ways that the world might have been. Areas correspond with sort of vaguer notions of what the world might have been. Right? So if I just tell you that my Nietzsche bust is black, well, that's going to sort of leave out a lot of logical space, namely all the logical space where my Nietzsche bust is not black. But of course, it's also going to leave in a lot of logical space because this determines just one thing about the world and nothing else. Um, this basically is the mental picture that I think we, we need to have about logical space. And this allows us to understand why Wittgenstein would talk about facts being in logical space and why he might want to say something like the facts in logical space are the world, right? They sort of determine the world. The, the world is sort of there in logical space as a sort of point in logical space. We are going to find this, this spatial metaphor many more times in the Tractatus and we will want to, to look at, at the details there. Okay, so that is a sort of a, a preliminary story about what Wittgenstein might mean by logical space and how we can think about that. The last thing I want to say about these numbers one is about proposition 1.21. Anyone, any fact that is, any fact can either be the case or not be the case and everything else remain the same. Any fact can either be the case or not be the case and everything else remain the same. This is a very surprising claim because we might think that there are lots of facts such that they are not independent of each other. Here is one example. My Nietzsche bust is black. Okay, that can be the case or not the case. Well, here's another fact. Well, it's not really a fact, but it's a possible fact. My Nietzsche bust is green. Well, those two facts are not independent of each other. If it is the case that my Nietzsche bust is black, then it cannot be the case that my Nietzsche bust is green. And if my Nietzsche bust is green, it cannot be the case that my Nietzsche bust is black. So these seem to be facts that are, you know, not such that they can either be the case or not be the case and everything else remain the same. And this is not just true about sort of one property taking on different values for a single object. Uh, it is true for lots of things. Right, here are three possible statements. Um, I am in Europe. My Nietzsche bust is in Europe. I am holding my Nietzsche bust in my right hand. Those three things are not independent of each other. If I'm in Europe and if I hold my Nietzsche bust in my right hand, then my Nietzsche bust is gonna be in Europe too. We can think of infinitely many examples like that. So why does Wittgenstein say something that seems to be false? Namely, that any fact can either be the case or not be the case and everything else remain the same. Well, we have to understand him here as making a specification about which facts he wants to talk about here. He wants to talk about something that um, maybe we had better call, and Wittgenstein in the Ogden and Ramsey translation is going to call it uh, an atomic fact. Right. There are going to be, according to Wittgenstein, certain basic facts out of which other facts are built up. And those basic facts are such that they are independent of each other. And those basic facts are the dimensions of logical space. And those basic facts are the ones about which 1.21 is true. 
So what Wittgenstein really does in 1.21 is he claims something as a truth, but really it's more a specification of what kinds of facts he is talking about here. Even though he might be talking about sort of more broadly about facts at later points in the text. But here he wants to talk about those basic, those atomic facts, which are independent of each other. Okay. Well, what are those atomic facts? The answer is that Wittgenstein will not tell us. And that Wittgenstein doesn't claim that he knows what the atomic facts are. And this is a surprising but important feature of the Tractatus. Wittgenstein is going to set up an ontology which contains these basic atomic facts and which also is going to contain simple things, sort of the most basic things that there are in the universe. But he's never going to tell us what they are. And he doesn't know what they are. And he doesn't claim he can know what they are. He claims to know that they must exist. They must exist because that is required by the nature of language and the nature of the world. If the world is something we can talk about with language, and we can, then the world must be like this and language must be like that. There must be atomic facts. There must be these basic simple things. But he doesn't know what they are. Now, especially in early interpretations of the Tractatus, people sometimes thought that they knew what the simple things or the atomic facts were. Uh, Wittgenstein doesn't tell us, but clearly he means, and then usually people would say something like um, the basic, basic mental facts of perception or something like that. But Wittgenstein doesn't think that at all. He doesn't claim to know what the atomic facts are, what the basic things are. Uh, and we should keep that in mind. On the one hand, it might be a bit disappointing. We get this ontology, but it remains at a very abstract level. On the other hand, you know, Wittgenstein is doing something that is methodologically sound. He doesn't think that logic can tell us what there is. It can only tell us something about the form that the world must have. Well, it must have, according to Wittgenstein, these, these elementary atomic facts. It must have these simple things. Uh, what they are, well, that's not something that logic is going to tell you. Okay. So that is what I wanted to tell about the proposition starting with one. And um, I'm not going to go through the entire text at this speed because then we would, well, not finish before I got very, very old. But I do think it's important, especially here at the beginning, to be clear about some of the basic ideas and basic methodological choices made by Wittgenstein. And I hope that this video has helped you understand, you know, this first half page of the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus.